What's up and welcome to episode of Gizmo Sled Tech. Today we are reviewing the Asus ROG G17 Strix. This is Asus's like mid-tier $1,700 high performance, but at the same time doesn't break your bank. We have LEDs all the way around the device, giving it an insanely LED-ified look. Basically, you're gonna either love this laptop on first glance, or you're gonna be like, what the heck? are they doing with that laptop? There's way too many lights on it. This is a very interesting laptop. It's a nice blend of moderately priced, good performance, still fairly portable, great battery life. Let's just dive into the review and we can get to all those juicy details. Here we go. Now before we get too far, I want to thank ZTech PC for sending out this machine. I'll have a few links in the description down below, but ZTech will be at the tippy top of that list. Now the first major pro to this device is obviously it's very LED heavy design. If you love LEDs, this laptop is for you and it's kind of an LED overload at a budget price because usually laptops with a lot of LEDs cost a lot of money. That said, you can turn the LEDs off and make it look more like a normal laptop. So those of you that don't like the LEDs, it's not really that big of a deal if you like everything else about the laptop. I really like how firm and sturdy this laptop is. It is one of the most rigid well-built laptops out there on the market today. There is a little bit of keyboard flex on the right side, but basically everywhere else, it is just so freaking solid. Now this laptop is a little bit unique in that the chassis is very deeply placed and the keyboard's pretty far up. So you've got this like five inch gap here between where your, your hand rests and your, your wrist rests. So it kind of digs into your wrist a little bit further back than most laptops. And some people will like that, some people won't like that. It'll all depend on what angle you use the laptop at. Now when I took off the bottom, we have three total PCIe SSD slots. The RAM is easily upgradable. And I did notice that along the left side, there was some room to put some more ports. So I'm kind of disappointed they didn't put another USB-C or full-size SD card slot over here. Now this is a solid display with 293 nits brightness at the brightest point, 91% sRGB and 70% Adobe RGB and the contrast ratio is also above average at 800 to 1. Now while gaming on the laptop it was fantastic with no ghosting, very responsive, great experience for high fast paced gameplay. That said it's not a top of the line 300 hertz display but that's okay. I don't think anyone but the most competitive of gamers are going to want to get a 300 hertz display anyway. Now overall I really like the feel of this keyboard. It has a nice feel, there's decent travel. Uh, and it's very responsive overall. And I do like the layout. The layout is very functional. We have a large number pad on the right. We do have a home and end button, but you do have to use the FN key to toggle between the two. And the other downside is that we have smaller than average arrow keys, but they are set off from the other keys. So they are very easy to find and use. All in all, the keyboard is a fantastic experience, but I wish they had redesigned the keyboard from the 15 inch model because this is basically the identical keyboard from the, uh, the ROG G15. I just wish more manufacturers would design 17 inch keyboards for 17 inch laptops. That said, using the same keyboard in the 15 and 17 inch versions saves some money and reduces the overall price. Now the touchpad on this machine is excellent. It's got a very smooth glass surface and the buttons are very tactile and consistent with the clickiness. Though I do prefer it when the buttons are underneath the touchpad, generally speaking. On the left side, we have three USB A's and a headphone port. And on the back, we have the power port, USB C, HDMI, and Ethernet. And there are no other ports on the right or front of the laptop. And this is just really surprising. The main ports that this is missing is the USB C power delivery, which is great for extending your battery life. We're also missing a Thunderbolt 3 and a full size SD card slot. Now, this machine comes with NVIDIA Optimus and it works quite well, though the first time I enabled it, I did have to restart the machine to get the NVIDIA GPU to switch off completely because it was sucking up the juice. Uh, but after that initial hiccup, it worked really, really well. I was able to get 10 hours of airplane mode use. Web browsing, you're looking about six to seven hours, about five hours of Netflix. So you've got some really good battery life on this machine, which really helps round out the overall portability of this machine. Now, I do wanna point out that this laptop, like a lot of the other Asus ROG laptops this year, does not have a webcam. No webcam anywhere on here. We do have some microphones down here, but that's it. So if your laptop doesn't have a webcam, you'll have to get one like this, which you can just mount right up here like that. All right, it's time, let's talk 
performance. How well does this thing actually perform for $1,700? What kind of frame rates can you get? Uh, let's start off with talking about the power limits of the CPU and GPU because that does determine the performance potential of the internal components. You can see in a dual load stress test, the power limit for the CPU is 50 watts approximately and the GPU has 112 watts. Now that is pretty good for the GPU, but for the CPU, that's a little bit disappointing. At the same time, you have to keep in mind, this is only a six core CPU, so we don't need quite as high of a power limit to hit max performance. That said, we do have shared heat sinks between the GPU and CPU in here, and you really have to power limit the CPU, otherwise the CPU temps go through the roof because there's just not enough thermal headroom. Now the nice thing about that shared GPU and CPU heatsink is that when you're running a CPU only load, you do have an increased power limit on the CPU of 82 watts, allowing for increased rendering speed, though again, we only have a six core CPU, which will kind of take a look at that performance here very shortly. So uh, how well does this game at 1080p? You can see in Red Dead Redemption on Ultra, we got right around 60 FPS. In Balance, 102. Red Dead Redemption on Low, 108. Valorant, we pushed well over 200 FPS. It's going to vary a bit from map to map, but about 240 FPS overall, which is really, really good performance and well above the 144 hertz refresh rate of the display. So basically with all the games that I've tested here, including Far Cry 5, Witcher 3, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we're getting over 90 FPS, pushing over 100 quite often. So that is just like fantastic, really fluid, very solid gameplay in basically all of these modern games. Two giant thumbs up. Now, how does this laptop stand up when we take a look at some synthetic benchmarks? Taking a look at 3D Mark Time Spy graphics, you can see that we got 7852, which almost catches up to the RTX 2080 Max-Q in the Alienware M15 R2, which is a laptop that costs almost twice as much as this one last year. That's some serious bang for the buck, which we'll see here in a second. Taking a look at our 3D Mark Time Spy points per pound, we're getting reasonable graphics performance per pound. And the reason why it's not super high on this list is because we're only dealing with an RTX 2070 instead of an RTX 2080 or 2080 Super, which would put it near the top of the list. And I'm sure we could fit in one of those GPUs in here, but it would drastically increase the price. You know, that's kind of going against the whole point of this laptop being a high performance machine for a reasonable price, which taking a look at the 3D Mark Time Spy graphics point per dollar, you can see that this one nearly tops the chart. It's third right now. If you're in the market right now for a laptop that's around $1,700, this is a great deal for you if you're a peer gamer. If you are not a peer gamer, then taking a look at Cinebench R20, you can see that we only have six cores in this machine and it really shows because we only got 2960 and we're just behind basically everything else on the market except other six core laptops. Now I do want to mention that I was able to successfully undervolt this machine by 0 0.08 millivolts and that was by going into the advanced BIOS inside of the BIOS and it's really not that hard and it basically doesn't let you mess it up either. So it's honestly maybe even a little bit easier to do than undervolting with Intel XTU. But the downside is we can only do a max undervolt of 0 0.08. So just know that when you take a look at the processing performance of this machine versus the other laptops with the identical processor, know that you're looking at that slight undervolt uh, affecting the scores. Now from a Cinebench R20 points per pound basis, you can see this laptop is again, basically bottom of the pack. It's really not a CPU rendering tool. Now the only shining light of hope here about the CPU performance is that when you take a look at the Cinebench points per dollar, we're actually in the middle of the pack and that's because of the moderate price tag for this machine, we're still getting decent CPU performance for the dollar. I mean, if you really do need to do a lot of CPU rendering, you probably want to go somewhere else, but if you only need to do it occasionally, this will still do the job. It'll still get it done, just not quite as quickly as some other machines. And to give you a realistic idea of the difference here, we have the Handbrake 4K render time. And we're coming in at 11 minutes and 19 seconds, which is literally more than double the Evoc NH. 584, which is a 16 core AMD Ryzen uh, laptop. If you're someone that needs to do a lot of CPU rendering, that is definitely a laptop to take a look at. All right, so this laptop has four primary power profiles. We have silent, performance, 
turbo and manual. Let's start with silent and see how that affects the performance and temperatures and fan noise. In silent fan mode, we got 44 decibels of fan noise, so that's very, very quiet. Now we got 74 degrees on the CPU and GPU, which is really good, but on the actual clock speeds, we got significantly reduced performance all around. And I mean, that's kind of what you expect if you want to have a really quiet laptop, you're really power limiting it, you're going to get a lot less performance out of it. Now, when you step up to performance mode, we still had very reasonable fan noise at 49 decibels, and the temperatures weren't too bad either with 80 degrees on the GPU and 84 degrees on the CPU. Now, when we go look at the actual clock speeds, you can see that we're getting a little bit less performance on the GPU and the CPU, and that's primarily due to slightly lower overall power limits for both. Uh, but the nice thing is we're getting better temperatures, so that's not bad. Now, when we set it to turbo and manual mode, we basically had identical performance between the two. Now, manual mode, you can adjust the fan profiles uh, so that the ramp up or ramp down at different temperatures for the CPU and GPU, which is nice. Slightly more complicated though. Now, in manual mode, you can also overclock the system a little bit more or less and uh, kind of find the sweet spot, which I, I did not do. I just used all defaults except for the fan mode, which I increased dramatically to max fan. And as you can see with the turbo and manual mode, we got 52.4 decibels, which is actually really, really reasonable. That's a very quiet overall fan for maximum fans. Now, the temperatures were not that great on the CPU, but they were solid on the GPU. Now, when it came to the actual clock speed performance, we did see the most possible performance in the turbo and manual modes, uh, but we also saw those really high CPU temperatures. So, and I mean, this is already pasted with really high quality CPU paste, so I would not expect much wiggle room here. If I was owning this laptop, I'd probably just run it in performance mode because that seems like a great blend of performance and reduced fan noise and overall really solid performance. Now in Far Cry 5, when you compare it to other laptops, we got 105 FPS, which is significantly above average, even outperforming the RTX 2070 Super Max Q and the GS66 Stealth, which again is a more expensive laptop the Alienware M15 R2 outperformed that one in the RTX 2080 Max-Q. That goes to show that the CPU in this machine is putting out solid performance because Far Cry 5 is significantly CPU bottlenecked. Now in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, we got 93 FPS, which is about what I would expect for a laptop like this, it's, it's putting out really solid performance here. Now, when it comes to laptop speakers, these are decent. They have reasonable all around sound, but the overall volume just doesn't get as loud as I would like. So they're kind of like middle of the pack, which I guess is okay considering the price point, I guess. <laughs> Before I wrap this up and put a bow on this review, I just want to talk about the RTX 3000 series GPUs that are being launched for the desktop right now. Those GPUs are going to make a huge impact in the laptop market in the coming months whenever the laptop versions of those GPUs are announced. The key takeaways for the 3000 series is that they're going to be more performance and they're more power efficient, which is huge for laptops because you're probably going to be able to get quite a bit more performance in a 3000 series GPU laptop. The other big thing is the 3000 series GPU laptops are cheaper, so it might drive the price of current RTX 2000 series laptops down a little bit. It's a, it's a whole convoluted mess. I made a full video on it. I'll have a link at the end of this video if you want to go check it out or a link in the description down below to that video. So should you buy this laptop right now or should you wait for a 3000 series laptop? I think the key, number one thing is how picky are you? Uh, about the frame rate because this thing puts out great frame rates and I don't think this laptop is going to become obsolete anytime soon like I think you're going to be really happy gaming on this for like three to four years most likely that's a really long shelf life for a laptop and considering the price to performance ratios we're talking here this is top of the line for price to performance around the $1,700 price point so if you can get this laptop for around $1,700 that's reasonable I think ideally, considering the looming 3000 series GPUs, I would lean more towards $1,500, $1,600 to make this an instant buy, but I'm going to leave that up to you. The ROG Strix G17 is a fantastic laptop for gamers who might want to do a little bit of CPU rendering or just not really any CPU rendering at all. Maybe they just want to do uh, college work, write papers, 
game on the side. Like this is a perfect laptop for people in that market segment. A great alternative to this machine would be the HP Omen 15Z, which I recently did a review on. Links in the description. If you enjoyed this review, please hit that like button. And if you want to see more of my videos, hit that subscribe button. And if you really want to be notified when I post a video, hit that notification bell and then mark it to all. Otherwise, the YouTube algorithm has complete control over whether or not you even see that I released a video. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Brandon, out. Watch out.